Ladies and gentlemen, hi. Today I've got some criminal evidence stuff for you. In particular, I'm going to be analysing the conjoined appeals of Loosley and the AG's reference number three of 2003. These are two cases that we look at quite a bit on the criminal evidence module at Surrey. And we do so when we're looking at the topic of improperly obtained evidence. And when we look at that topic, we tend to focus on the notion of police entrapment in order to get an idea of the broader topic. Now, in terms of the case itself, the first thing that I should say, if it wasn't evident already, is that this is a conjoined appeal and therefore it's two separate cases being considered at the same time. There is some similarity on the facts, but broadly the legal issue that the court's being asked to decide is the same in each case. Now, in each case, the appellant was separately convicted of supplying controlled drugs to undercover policemen. And broadly, the issue in the case is what conduct by undercover officers will constitute entrapment of such a kind that either the evidence obtained by that entrapment should be excluded under Section 78 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act or is so serious that it should be stayed as an abuse of process. Now, what I'd like to suggest at this stage of our analysis is that contextually there is a moral dilemma that the law has to face up to here um, and we do see the court address this in the case of Loosley. Now the dilemma arises because it is necessary in some cases for law enforcement agencies to undertake covert op operations including things that akin to entrapment in order to investigate crime in particular certain types of crime. But at the same time, on the other hand, citizens should not be tempted into committing offences which they would not otherwise have committed, only for the state to then go on and prosecute them. Put quite simply, the job of the police is, of course, to prevent and detect crime rather than to create crime, only to go on and then prosecute it. So that, I would suggest, is a moral dilemma. We see the dilemma addressed in the case of Loosley. We could look back into earlier cases, such as the 19 cases, 1980 case of Sang, and say, well, there's largely, the court there is largely oblivious to uh, the existence of any moral dilemma, and things have moved on in the 20 years between those two cases, and we'll see how they've moved on as we continue our analysis of Loosley and AG's reference. When we look at the judgment, the resolution of that issue, our understanding of the resolution is relatively simple because the judges were unanimous. What makes it slightly harder to appreciate is the fact that four of the five judges decided to give substantive judgments in their own right. So that adds a degree of complexity in terms of your reading and analysis of the case. In terms of the facts, uh, I'll be relatively brief on the facts, but the best place to go to if you want to see the facts in more detail is the judgment of Lord Hutton. If I look at Loosley first, what happens here is that the, the police in Loosley had concerns about the supply of drugs in a particular area, and which for interest of Surrey students was the Wooden Bridge pub in Guildford. Um, and because of their concerns, they approached an apparent drug dealer and asked to buy some drugs. So relatively straightforward drug purchase um, scenario. In AG's reference, the second case, the facts are slightly different because here the police offered to sell the appellant contraband cigarettes. And it was only later, as the deal was taking place, that they asked if he could get them some heroin. And eventually they persuaded him to supply these drugs um, and he managed to obtain them from a third party. Now he stated that he was not into heroin and in an interview under caution he said that he only supplied the drugs in return for the favour that the police were doing him by supplying him with these cheap cigarettes. Of course he didn't know it was the police that were doing this. So in summary there is a discreet difference in the nature of the opportunity provided to the appellants in each case and that becomes crucial in the understanding of the outcomes of these two particular cases and in particular the way that the court approaches the resolution of the, the main issue. I'll say more about that when, when I get to it. But the first thing 
that I need to do now is look at the certified questions in each of the cases, and they are different in each case. So if we look at um, Loosley first, uh, the undercover policeman in Loosley was goes by the name of Rob, and here's the certified question. Should the judge have reviewed, refused to admit the evidence of the undercover police officer Rob because the role played by Rob went beyond observation and involved asking the appellant to supply him with heroin, a request which, on the judge's findings, the appellant readily agreed. So there we have a relatively simple question in Loosley. It's about the role played by the police. He wasn't passive. He actually asked for the drugs. And therefore, the question is, should the judge have refused to admit that evidence under Section 78? Now, in AG's reference, it's a slightly more complex question because it asks about the impact of European or ECHR law um, on English law here. And the question posed here by the Court of Appeal for the House of Lords is, in a case involving the commission of offences by an accused at the instigation of undercover police officers, to what extent, if any, have the judicial discretion conferred by Section 78 of PACE and the power to stay proceedings as an abuse of the court been modified by Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights and the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights? So you can see that there's a European angle that arises in the second case of AG's reference. Now, the next thing I want to do is ask, what do I mean by this phrase entrapment? Or in particular, what did the court mean by the use of the phrase entrapment? Um, and a useful definition can be found in the judgment of Lord Hoffman, because he says this. He says, entrapment occurs when an agent of the state, usually a law enforcement officer or a controlled informer, causes someone to commit an offence in order that he should be prosecuted. And at this stage, I want to emphasize this word causes, causes someone to commit an offense, because you see a lot of these trigger words such as cause, insight, instigate. Um, and it's our understanding of these words that help us understand what is acceptable and what is unacceptable police conduct. Now, Lord Hoffman then goes on to state the commonly held position under English law that um, entrapment itself cannot be a defense. So you can't plead it as an absolute defence. And having recognised that, he then identified that there are two potential um, avenues for a person where evidence is brought against them on the basis of entrapment. One is to seek to have it excluded under Section 78 of PACE, and the other is to apply for a stay of proceedings on the grounds that it's abuse of process. Now, on the basis of these alternatives, what I want to do now is focus really on the judgment of Lord Nichols. Um, and I'm attracted to this judgment. In my opinion, his rhetoric is very grand, um, but the force of his reasoning is um, strong. Um, he recognises from the very first sentence in his judgment that every court has not just an inherent power to prevent an abuse of process, but a duty to prevent an abuse of its process. And in the second sense of, sentence of his judgment, he links this power and this duty to the rule of law when he says, it is simply not acceptable that the state through its agents should lure, which is another one of those trigger words, lure its citizens into committing acts forbidden by the law and then seek to prosecute them for doing so. That would be entrapment. That would be a misuse of state power and an abuse of the process of the courts. The role of the court is to stand between the state and its citizens and make sure this does not happen. So powerful stuff from Lord Nichols. But the difficulty here lies in identifying what is meant by this word lure that he mentions there. Because one of the things that Lord Nichols um, properly, of course, recognises that the police often have to be more than passive observers. Um, detection of certain crimes, particularly consensual crimes committed in private, such as the supply of drugs, they're going to be difficult to detect without some degree of proactivity on the part of the police. So in effect, he's accepting that dilemma that, that I put forward in my earlier contextual analysis. Now, 
Before he goes on to examine the acceptable limits of police conduct in this respect, he reviews the position in English law. He reiterates that it's long been accepted that um, entrapment is not a defence under English law. And he refers to the 1980 case of Sang in support of this. And this case of Sang, in a wider context, is really a good start point for consideration of entrapment. And at Surrey, we tend to start with Sang, look at Section 78, and then look at stay of proceedings, um, in particular the case that we're now looking at loosely as uh, three points on a particular road. Um, interestingly, in the case of Sang, only one judge actually considered an abusive process and he, he ruled that out relatively quickly. So again, I'm, I'm suggesting that in 20 years there is this big change in terms of the court's approach to entrapment, this um, ability to engage with the moral dilemma. But importantly, what happened in saying the court concluded that there was no common law discretion to exclude evidence obtained by entrapment. So what happens between 1980 in Sang and um, the case of Loosley? Well, Lord Nichols identifies that there was substantial uh, development in the 20-year period. Um, but the first development is triggered by Parliament when it introduces the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, in particular Section 78, because this provides a judge with a discretion to exclude evidence on the basis that its admission would have such an adverse effect on the fairness of the proceedings that the court ought not to admit the evidence. Now the statutory discretion specifically includes the words including the circumstances in which the evidence was obtained and therefore whilst the common law discretion identified in Sang remains and indeed is expressly preserved by Pace as Lord Nichols recognised Sang has effectively, in this context at least, been overtaken by the statute. And when I'm looking for a way to explain how Section 78 has affected Sang, I like to use this phrase, effectively overtaken, which shows that in a theoretical sense, um, Sang remains, but at the same time it has little practical application in this context. Now, as well as this statutory development, Lord Nichols identified that the common law had also been developing since 1980 in the case of Sang. And whilst he referred to a number of cases, there are two that I identify as being key in his analysis. The first of these is the 1994 case of Horsbury Road Magistrates ex parte Bennett, because here the House of Lords recognised the court having this inherent jurisdiction to stay proceedings where there has been a serious abuse of power by the executive which of course includes the police in this context. And the second case is that of Latif, L-A-T-I-F, where the House of Lords confirmed that this principle could be applied to entrapment cases. So those are two very strong developments, and of course the other thing that's happened in the meantime is of course the enactment of the Human Rights Act. So one can also claim that the use of evidence obtained by entrapment could also affect a, an an accused right to a fair trial under Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And you might recall that the certified question in AG's reference is all about the ECHR impact on English law. Now, in terms of those options, crucially, what Lord Nichols says in the case of Loosley is that if there has been this entrapment, this unacceptable type of entrapment, then of the available remedies, stay of proceedings rather than exclusion should be regarded as the appropriate response. So it's treated that seriously that the proceedings are stopped. Now one of the key things that the case does is it looks at the limits of what is acceptable or unacceptable police um, conduct. Now the first thing that Lord Nichols does is to exclude predispos predisposition in the defendant as being the criterion for making the decision. Now this takes a little bit of thinking for me because you might think if somebody was, um, I don't know, had convictions for drug dealing that it's more acceptable that the police would trap them but that's not actually the reasoning. The reasoning here is not on what um, 
is the predisposition of the defendant, but what is the nature of the behaviour by the police. So Lord Nichols suggests that instead, and this is a crucial test that comes out of this case, is that Lord Nichols suggests that as a useful guide one consider, should consider whether the police did no more than present the defendant with an unexceptional opportunity to commit a crime. And so this really for me becomes the key test from the case. Did the police present the defendant with no more than an unexceptional opportunity to commit the crime? And here he means that the conduct of the police is no more than might be expected from others in the circumstances. So if I go into a pub and ask somebody, would you sell me drugs? Then that is the normal behaviour we might expect from somebody who wants to buy drugs. Um, if I went in and offered somebody an extortionate amount of money for a small amount of drugs, then that might be an exceptional opp opportunity. So that's a useful guide. But what he does say, it, when he identifies the crucial question, he says that in every case, the overall consideration is whether the conduct of the police was so seriously improper as to bring the administration of justice into disrepute. And if justice is brought into disrepute, then there should be a stay of proceedings. Now, he does recognise when considering the degree of police proprietary, um, the nature of the offence might be relevant, the reason for the police operation, for example, it was based on intelligence in Loosley, um, and also the extent of the police participation. All of those things might all be relevant to the way that the court makes its ultimate decision. Now, in terms of how the court resolved this, I go back to the certified questions, um, and here I go to the judgment of Lord Hutton because he answers them quite succinctly. Now, if you remember, the question in um, Loosley was whether the evidence of um, the undercover policeman should have been excluded, and here the answer was no, it need not have been. And his appeal was dismissed as the police officer had merely presented himself as an ideal customer for a drug deal, and the conduct, therefore, didn't constitute incitement. Now, that's what Lord Hutton said. He didn't use Lord Nichols' phrase, but in effect, if we, if we use the language of Lord Nichols, here in Loosley was just an unexceptional, unexceptional opportunity, and therefore police conduct was exception, acceptable. Now, turn to, to the certified question in 80's reference, um, and here the House of Lords thought that English law was in conformity with um, the European Court of Human Rights and the ECHR, and therefore it had not been modified. They were in harmony, in effect. Now, in terms of understanding the case we're looking at, that might be sufficient, but if you want to understand European convention jurisprudence in a wider context for this subject, you might want to look at the case of Texera and Portugal, which is referred to in the Loosley judgment. And if you want to see that case in operation in the domestic case, if you look at the case of Not City Council and the Min, they actually refer to the decision in Texera in that judgment. <clears throat> so that's the answer to the certified question. But what is interesting, for me at least, is on the facts, Lord Hutton went on to say that he agreed that the trial judge in this case was correct to stay the proceedings here as the police officers had actually instigated the offence. That is, they did more than give him the opportunity to commit the offence. They offered him inducements that would not ordinarily be associated with the commission of such an offence. And therefore, if we go back to the language of Lord Nichols, they offered the appellant in the AG's reference an exceptional opportunity. And on that basis, the police conduct was unacceptable and a remedy should be available to the appellant. And as Lord Nichols had identified, the correct remedy in such cases is that of stay of proceedings. And therefore, the trial judge in the second of the appeals, 80's reference, was supported by the House of Lords in his decision to stay the proceedings.